Vamos a comenzar ahora con la charla From Dev to DevOps, An Expected Journey, de Luis Ángel Vicente Sánchez. Muchas gracias. So, welcome to this talk, uh, From Dev to DevOps, An Unexpected Journey. I thought about uh, calling this talk From Zero to Hero, but that won't mean I know what I'm doing, and I'm not so sure about that. So, this, let me explain what I, I, mean, I understand for DevOps. DevOps is the intersec intersection of development, operations, and uh, QA. It's all about the uh, practices and tools that we choose to deal with uh, source control, uh, code review, branching strategies, how we automate our builds, how we do continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous testing, how we automate the releases, uh, how we do configuration management, or even infrastructure as code, uh, how we log uh, and access those logs, how we trigger alerts based on some conditions, how we monitor. That's DevOps. So these are just a few of the tools that my team is using right now to solve all these problems. And let me introduce myself. I'm, uh, my name is Luis. Uh, I have 12 plus years of experience as a software engineer and a big fan of functional programming. I have been doing a lot of big data lately. So why I'm here? So I'm a software engineer. Why I'm giving a talk about DevOps in a DevOps conference? So it all started like six months ago. I decided to move to contracting, and I joined a, a, a team to build a data lake. A data lake is, you know that companies have a lot of data, but the data is usually in silos. So one team has a lot of data, another team has some different data, sometimes they have the, sa the same data, so there is a lot of duplication because they don't know that the other team has already that information available. So a data lake is, is a way to put all that information in one single place. And provide tools to search for that information so we don't download against the same data and uh, reprocess it. How to request, request access to that information. How to re uh, revoke access to some uh, of that information. How to know uh, who is using our data so we can build them. So it's not just about the services, it's about the infrastructure that uh, supports that, uh, those services. And when I joined the team, uh, the place where I can add uh, more value was the infrastructure. So that's how my journey from Dev to DevOps started. And it hasn't been an easy uh, journey, it has not been a, but it hasn't been also a, a road to, to hell. There were some problems, there were some challenges, but we overcame them. And I have been thinking how to tell you about this uh, journey. And in the end, I thought that the best way to do it is to start from the beginning. So uh, the first thing I had to do when I joined this team was to install Kafka and Cassandra into AWS. But I had some constraints. I had to do it with infrastructure as code, and I couldn't tie myself to uh, vendor tools. So no Amazon command line interface or things like that. So I have no clue how to do it, because that was my first time doing something like that. And somebody on my team uh, mentioned Terraform from HashiCorp. And Terraform is a tool that you use to create and update your uh, infrastructure in a predictable uh, and easy way. And in my experience, that's quite true, actually. What you do with Terraform, more often than not, is to create modules that you can reuse. So my first task was, task was to create two Terraform modules, one for Cassandra and one for Kafka. Well, actually, you have to create another for Zookeeper, because Kafka needs Zookeeper. But the less I talk about Zookeeper, the better. So Terraform is super easy. It's all about resources. You need to install Cassandra and Kafka on AWS. You need some EC2 instances. So that's uh, AWS instance resource on, on Terraform. Then you need some hard drives, because it's, uh, one is a database and the other is a distributed log. And you need somewhere to put those logs. So you create an AWS uh, uh, EBS volume. And the last thing you need to do is, OK, I have some hard drives. I have some instances. You attach the instances uh, to the, uh, the, 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 the databases, uh, the hard drives, to the instances. And you can do that uh, with Terraform as well. But there is something missing here. We have the servers, but we don't have the software. And how do you provision the, the, the software uh, using Terraform? Terraform understands uh, about provisioners. And they, also, they even have a module for Chef. But I had to install just Cassandra and Kafka. So installing Chef just to do that, 
was a bit uh, of an overkill. But luckily, Terraform allows you to do things like connect to the instances that you have just created, upload some files with uh, one provisioner, and then execute those files, those scripts, so to install the software. So this is simple enough for just two servers or two services. If you have way more than two, don't do this, because uh, this is way time involved. Uh, then if you have more services that you need to display, uh, deploy this way, either use the chef module or integrate with Ansible, Puppet, or something else, because it's quite easy to do. And as I said, I only have to do uh, this for Cassandra and Kafka, because pretty soon in the project, we decided that everything was going to be a, a Docker container. We All our applications and services will run as Docker containers, and they will run on Kubernetes. Why Kubernetes? My team is a team of four people, and we have to deploy all the infrastructure for this data lake, and we have to build the services on top of, the, of this uh, data lake. So we are not enough people to do things that a normal company with more people will be able to do, like build something that will uh, uh, restart the apps when they fail or when they became unresponsive. Kubernetes gives you that for free. And when you deploy an app on Kubernetes, uh, you give it a, a DNS name. So when somebody wants to access that uh, app, it, they use that DNS name. And if you have multiple copies of your app, all of them are behind that DNS name. So the load balancing is for free. You don't have to do anything. And also the auto-scaling is for free. You can do it easily with a command line, uh, uh, with a, uh, command line tool. But also there is something called the horizontal pod pod auto scaler. So based on CPU usage, memory usage, or even some application level metrics, Kubernetes will uh, increase the number of pods for you. So you get auto scaling almost for free. So when I joined the company, there was already a Kubernetes cluster created because they made that decision before I even joined. And this cluster was created with a tool called COPS. COPS is a Kubernetes operation. Operations. It's a tool to create a Kubernetes cluster on AWS. And it makes this super simple. With those four commands, you have a, a Kubernetes cluster with one master and an instance group of 2T2 medium instances. But 2T2 medium instances is not good enough. They are, you don't have enough compute power to run anything there. So you need to upgrade the cluster. And you do it like that. Just two commands, you add more instance groups, you um, increase the number of instances of a given instance group, you change the type of the instance, and this will uh, roll out those changes with zero downtime. So by the time this finishes, all your uh, instance groups will have the new configuration, and nobody will have noticed that. So that's super simple to create a Kubernetes cluster, especially if you have a small team. So you want, or you have to create a, a cluster on, uh, on AWS, give it a try. And now that we have a cluster, more powerful cluster, and we have enough computing resources, enough memory to run applications, how, we do deploy, uh, how do we deploy applications on Kubernetes? There is a tool called kubectl. It's a command line tool, and that's what you use to create uh, applications on Kubernetes. And the building blocks are pods and services. A pod is just uh, one or more Docker containers that they are deployed as a single unit. And more, well, all the pods have something like here, like labels, it's like tagging in a blog post. You say that this pod belongs to Nginx. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to, of tagging uh, the pods. Uh, but there is a problem. If you just deploy a pod, nobody can access it because nobody knows how to find it. That's why you have services. Services are, li are like load balancers. This, this is the DNS name that I was talking uh, uh, before. And how a service know uh, which ports uh, are serving the, 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 the service, or, the, uh, or which ports are part of your application? Because they use uh, a selector here. So everything that has, uh, is, belongs to Nginx will receive traffic from that service. So you see that this is how you auto-scale. 
you add one more pod, the service will detect that at runtime and will start sending traffic to that pod. And the same if you scale down. It will detect that that pod doesn't exist anymore and it will not redirect traffic to that pod anymore. But scaling up and down manually is a bit uh, boring because maybe you have 50 different pods of a given application. That's why you have uh, something called a deployment. A deployment is nothing more than number of instances of my pod and what I'm going to use to create that pod. That way, you can create 10 instances of your pod, and then through a command line, you can tell the deployment, give me two more, or go down to five. And you can also create another scaler saying, for this, this deployment, I only want to have 50% of the CPU usage all the time. So you have to add more pods. So cool, we have a cluster, we can deploy apps. What happens when something goes wrong? How do you know what's going on in your cluster? Do you go and SSH on an undefined number of uh, pods? Well, you could do that. We did that for a while, but that doesn't scale. But if your apps are following the 12-factor app uh, manifesto or they are following the Docker conventions, you can just throw FluentD, Elasticsearch, and Kibana to your cluster. And with that, you will have access uh, to your logs from anywhere in the world. How that works? Well, you will have a, a copy of FluentD on each node of your cluster. This is called a daemon set, if you want to know that. And FluentD will collect all the logs from all the pods and push that into Elasticsearch. And then Kibana will index the content of Elasticsearch and it will uh, let you query for it through the Kibana uh, user interface. And so that's great. Now we can f solve problems. But how do we know we have a problem? Do we wait until a client calls, an angry client, or maybe your manager? That's not ideal. So how we solve that? We throw more services to our Kubernetes cluster. We add Hipster, Grafana, InfluxDB, and in the same way, Hipster will read all the metrics about your nodes and pods, CPU usage, memory usage, uptime. It will write that to InfluxDB, and with Grafana, you can create some dashboards and also some alerts. And if you want to be alerted not just about a CPU usage, because sometimes you want to know if suddenly there is a 80% CPU spike or 90%, 100%. But more often than not, you are, in, you are interested on raising alerts when there are like errors, like 500 error, if you have a REST API, or 404s, or whatever. Then you can just throw Telegraph uh, to your cluster. Then Telegraph will receive metrics from uh, your nodes and your applications using the StatsD uh, line protocol. It will aggregate all that information and write that into InfluxDB. And then from Grafana, now you can either trigger an alert because there, there is a spike of CPU usage, or trigger an alert because there are like more than 10, 500 errors in uh, one minute. And you will say, OK, that's really cool. But uh, now I have to install six services on my, on my Kubernetes cluster. That has to be hard. And it's actually not that hard, because the com Kubernetes community is so awesome that all the manifests and all the files that you need to deploy this and make it work are already there. So usually you deploy like oh. you go, you deploy these three manifests, and they all start talking to each other because there are some naming conventions. And if the names doesn't match, you just need to do some minor config changes, configuration changes, and everything just works. So for a small team like us, that is huge because I can maintain all the cluster myself. I can deploy all the services myself, while the other members of the team are adding business value, adding uh, new applications. Not that this is not business value, but some manager doesn't see that. So OK, we have a cluster. We know uh, when there is a problem. We can de uh, debug the problem because we have access to the logs. And so far, we have been deploying things manually. And that's OK when you have like one, two applications. But the more applications you have, if you keep that process as a manual process, you need to dedicate somebody in the team just to do that. 
and this is a tedious, boring, time-consuming process. And you know when there are like tedious, boring, time-consuming processes that anybody can do, you automate them. So how did we uh, automate the the deployment pipeline? It was a, an easy one. We were already using GitLab as the source control uh, tool. So we moved to GitLab CI. And on GitLab CI, you have like deployment pipelines. And your deployment pipeline is nothing more than a, a set of stages. You have one, two, three, four, five stages that all of them run sequentially. And if one of them fails, the rest of the stages will not run. And each of the stages have one or more jobs that are run on parallel. And any of those jobs for a given stage fails, the whole stage is considered uh, uh, to, f to have failed. So this is how our pipeline should like. We have a build stage, test stage, we publish some containers, and then we deploy. And how do you define the stages? It's a YAML file. So you at the beginning of your file, you have uh, the list of stages. Then you have some jobs. For these jobs, you say, OK, this job belongs to the build stage. The next job belongs to the published container stage. You have a script that will tell GitLab what to do on that uh, stage. And then you have some triggers, like this one, only tags. Because some stages can, uh, by default, they run on every single commit. But maybe you want to only deploy tags. I don't know. GitLab CI gives you that ability. So if we revisit our pipeline, it actually looks like this. Because for many projects, most of them actually, we commit to master. We don't have feature branches. Uh, there was a huge argument in the team. Three members were uh, big fans of this new way of doing things, or all way. Uh, so this happens always for every commit on master. But for some other projects, we only want to build a container and deploy it when we create a tag. So this is the, uh, an alternative uh, pipeline. And the most interesting part here is not how we build, what, how we test, how we publish the containers. It's how we deploy. Because we need to deploy to Kubernetes. So what we do? Do we use kubectl? Yes, we did for a while. But there is a problem. At some point, you need to roll back. Because some undetected bug went to production, and you need to quickly roll back. You cannot afford to spend like three hours rolling back. And with kubectl, your manifests are going to live in your repo. And if you want to go back to a tag or a given commit, you can do it. You can just tell GitLab OK, rerun this pipeline. But it's going to rerun the pipeline. So it's going to build, it's going to test, it's going to publish the container, and only then it's going to deploy. And that's slow. That could be fast. But if you're using, for example, a Scala, that could be a really long process. So we couldn't afford that. We wanted to roll back with minimal delay. And also, we wanted to be able to do it uh, from the command line without having to check out the repo, go back to a commit, and do something. So kubectl discarded. So now, now what? Kubernetes Helm. Kubernetes Helm is the package manager of Kubernetes. And it helps you with your applications by putting everything that makes your application an application, all the services, all the pods, everything that will help you to deploy that application to Kubernetes in one single chart. It's called a Helm chart. And a Helm chart has some files with metadata, so people can guess what your application is going to do. You have some variables with default values that you can change when you are going to deploy. Uh, so you can sample if the database password is different in production. That's where you put it. Well, maybe not here, but you get it. And then you have lots of templates. They are like normal manifest, but, uh, with, a use, um, but with Go template language. So all the variables are replaced here. So that means that you can deploy this app to your dev environment, to your production environment, to any other environment. You can even share it with some friends if they want to use your application. And it will work. Uh, and deploying a Helm chart is super easy. You just run that command line, and you will be able to deploy a Helm chart from the uh, local file system. And I said from the local file system. And that's not good enough, because 
if we do that, we have the same problem that with kubectl. We need to go back to a given commit. Maybe we can rerun the, just the Helm chart deployment, but you need to do, go and do a lot of stuff that you really need, doesn't need to do, like clicking or git, check out, tag, whatever. But luckily, Helm supports something uh, called a Helm repo. A Helm repo is nothing more than a HTTP server with an index file that contains all the information about the, all the charts in your repo. And then it contains also all your charts for all the versions of your applications uh, compressed in with the uh, uh, gzip. And there are many ways to create a uh, Helm repo. I, will, uh, I decided to use the lazy engineer way. So go to GitHub, find somebody else that have already done it, and use it. And I was able to find one that not only was on GitHub, but also on Docker Hub. So deploying this to my Kubernetes cluster was like a, a one minute job. And I have, I had a, now a Helm repo. Now deploying is even simpler. You are telling to Helm, go to the Helmet repo, that's the name of our repo, then um, get my chart, but not any my chart, version 1.2.3 and deploy it. So I can wake up 3 a.m. and deploy a previous version of the app without even having to go to GitLab or whatever. Just I can even write a script just to, to say, deploy my chart one, two, three. And that's it. You don't need to do anything else. And we are using semantic version here because it's a requirement from Helm. But uh, if you're doing commit to master, you need to put the commit has somewhere. So you can add it uh, at the end of the of the version as we are doing. But that's about it. So with all these tools, just one guy, me, can maintain a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I think that for the last three months and a half, all the other team members have been doing a, have been building services. I have been the only one involved in most all of, most of it. Actually, I think I only had help while upgrading the cluster. Everything else, I could do it myself just a simple Google search and run some commands. So that's how you move to Dev from DevOps. You embrace the tools that are out there. Uh, you use them. Sometimes you fail. You discard a tool. You choose another one. And then you success. And what we have to pay since we introduced uh, Helm, we will need to add one more stage, publish the chart. But that gave give us a lot of freedom, so it's a little pay to price, a little price to pay. So now is when you should do questions, but there is no questions. So thank you. <laughs>